So, welcome everybody to our talk about the uh, AnyNines experience we had with um, operating Open Source Cloud Foundry. Um, let's begin with uh, our talk. So, what does experience report Cloud Foundry operation, open source operations exactly mean? Yeah, we started three years ago with an um, open source Cloud Foundry public installation and um, setting uh, such a system up, we've uh, faced a lot of uh, challenges because we have uh, some requirements we had for our public installation. And we think uh, people doing the same uh, thing as we did have the same challenges. So we're trying to share our solutions and our experience we gained through these three years yeah, to ex uh, inspire you, help you doing your own thing. Yeah, so let's start it. Before we ac really dive in in our talk, we first like to introduce ourselves and give you a short uh, overview about the structure of our talk. Um, so some of you uh, may have noticed that the talk uh, was uh, initially proposed by uh, our colleague uh, Julian Weber, but he couldn't come, uh, he couldn't come here. Uh, in Santa Clara, so uh, we replaced him. The thing is uh, that uh, he did more operations uh, than we are, uh, so he's, he's way more knowledgeable in this, but we've been working with, uh, with the installation uh, for a couple of years now, so I guess uh, we should be able to uh, guide you through a presentation and, um, and hopefully also answer uh, your questions uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, I'm Lucas Pinto, I'm a French guy, I'm living in uh, Berlin and working there. Uh, I've been a Rails developer for a long time, so I'm more on the dev side. And I've joined the N9 team, uh, N9 uh, team a bit more than a year ago, uh, where uh, I helped them with, uh, with the Ruby uh, knowledge uh, that I have. Uh, if you have any questions after a talk, um, you can uh, contact me on my email address or ping me on Twitter. So my name is Stefan Suba. I'm working in the any Nights team since two years now. Um, I also co-developed the service framework we used in our public installation and also helping in the operations of our public installation. Yeah, as Lucas mentioned it, just um, write us the mail, ping us on Twitter, or come to our booth. We have a booth in the foundry if you have any questions. Yeah, so let's start with our talk. Yeah. So the talk will be articulated this way. First, uh, we'll look at what a standard uh, open source uh, Cloud Foundry uh, looked like three years ago. Uh, like our, like um, yeah, our friends at the Nature uh, Springer say, that's a, a Didin dinosaur era uh, when it comes to a Cloud Foundry. But uh, I think it's still uh, an interest, uh, interesting uh, things to, uh, to observe and analyze. And what we'll do is uh, look at the weaknesses uh, of this installation uh, for our concerns, which is uh, serving uh, clients. Um, and we'll try to spot uh, where it doesn't really uh, fit our uh, re requirements. Um, then will come the most interesting parts, the solutions we choose, uh, the strategies uh, we choose, the solutions we implemented to uh, come around uh, those, uh, those weaknesses. And uh, then we'll have, if time allows, we'll have a small round of questions, but. Uh, as Stefan said, uh, we have a booth in the main hall and you can uh, definitely come uh, talk to us about it. Uh, we're unfortunately out of swags. Uh, we brought uh, really uh, nice swags, but they were so good that they're all gone by now. Hopefully, we'll see you in Frankfurt. We'll be there, have a bigger booth, have more swags, and uh, we'd love to talk to you uh, in Germany. Yeah, let's start with the requirements. Listing, first of all, what we had for requirements for public installation. What the goals are, we want to aim for and want to achieve. And one of the main uh, requirements we had was high availability because uh, our public installation should be used by uh, our clients and also by our developers for their internal projects. And their apps should be running all the time. So a downtime of apps for most people co um, means that they lost money and reputation and if our customers or clients lose money and reputation, the same goes for us. And one thing we learned in these three years, everything fails. Processes fail, virtual machines fail, really everything fails. So you have to keep that in mind if you want to design a system that should be available all time. Unfortunately, there are some patterns you can use to um, 
yes, um, stable your system. The first thing is to make your Cloud Foundry com components and important, make them redundant. Use clusters as your baking services. Um, another important point is to aim for fast failovers, which means if some part of your uh, system goes down, it's recreated really fast. And for that, you should also have some kind of auto healing system. We are, as we are using Cloud Foundry, for that we're using Bosch, like it's always there if you have Cloud Foundry. And it's pretty good at self healing um, demands. Second point is uh, resilience. Uh, some of you are uh, microservices builders, so I guess you are aware of, uh, of the meaning of resilience in this context. Uh, the idea is that an issue that happens somewhere should be contained uh, where it happens and shouldn't propagate uh, through your installations. Uh, uh, so that means that uh, it shouldn't cascade and uh, it will make, of course, it easier to spot and to fix. Uh, an example for that is the uh, recommendation service on an online shop. If, uh, your uh, recommendation service is down, it shouldn't mean that uh, your users can't use your uh, minimal, vi minimal viable product, uh, which is placing others, right? Uh, maybe the uh, recommendation service won't be there anymore, won't be shown, maybe you have a placeholder for that, but it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't um, uh, yeah, impact uh, your user in that way. Uh, so uh, which, what we had in mind is uh, to keep boundaries between our services and to, uh, uh, to be sure that we handle uh, those kind of uh, failures uh, properly. Uh, because uh, as uh, Stefan said, uh, failure is something that is going to happen. Uh, you have to be uh, aware of it and build a system that is uh, coupled loosely enough so that the uh, impact uh, of the death of a component uh, will be a uh, minimum. So next important point is, as I mentioned before, self-healing. That means if a failed systems uh, well, the system fails, it gets automatically recreated without that you have to do manually anything. And there are two uh, aspects important. First of all, monitoring and uh, auto-provisioning. Monitoring here means that you have health checks for your um, components so that you can detect if there is a failure. Auto-provisioning is the, or means that you don't have, let's say, to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning in your pajama, starting your virtual machine again. And there are also perfect examples in the Cloud Foundry environment. You have the self-healing for applications done by the DA or now by Diego. And you have also the same thing by Bosch. For jobs that are um, deployed by the Bosch director, he um, um, detects if there is a job missing or failing and uses the deployment manifest to recreate it without you to have to do anything. And that's really amazing about Bosch, and that's why we are still using it and started with it. Um, the last thing is uh, something we won't go, uh, we won't really talk about during the talk, but that's still requirements we had, and it's uh, monitoring, uh, because we want to be uh, aware of issues before everything's crash. We want to be aware of them as fast as possible, and so uh, we have to build uh, endpoints uh, for uh, logging and for uh, metrics, and to uh, then bind them uh, with uh, uh, stuff as uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, or uh, well, in our case it was uh, Graphite, um, then, then we bound to uh, Grafana. You may also have heard of uh, Firehose or Noah. Uh, there have been a couple, I've seen a couple of talks uh, about, um, about uh, monitoring. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't see uh, uh, any of them. Uh, I hope uh, you folks did. And uh, well, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's the last of our requirements. Yeah, so we, as we mentioned now, the requirements we have, we can now go forward and do an analysis of the Cloud Foundry system. We did before we um, start setting up the system. And this uh, part, we um, looked at all components in the Cloud Foundry environment and spotted possible single points of failure or components that doesn't fit our requirements. There's a little overview about the uh, Cloud Foundry environment. Um, keep in mind that is, we started three years ago, so today it look quite, looks quite different. And I think most of you have always uh, seen them. You have the HA proxy and the router for the incoming requests, Cloud Controller, Cloud Controller database, and the blob store for the API, your um, organizations, the applications. 
the UAA and UA, UAADB for managing the identity in Cloud Foundry, DEA for running your applications, Health Manager for the self-feeding of the applications, and last but not least, the NUTS, which is responsible for the um, messaging within the system. What we, are, what we have done before we started it, we um, analyzed, as I mentioned it, every component regarding redundancy, high availability, and consequences an outage of one of these components would have in our system. And we also have uh, to keep in mind um, issues that can arise because of our um, environment. That uh, means we are try to serve our clients and make them happy. And one point is that we are using OpenStack in the infrastructure layer. So as you see on this slide, the orange boxes are the points we figured out are uh, critical in our system. That means if one of these components would fail, we have an outage in our system. And in the next few slides, we will uh, go through every component and um, talk uh, in more in detail what the problem here is. So uh, the, first, uh, the first thing we wanted to talk about is uh, the databases. Uh, so those uh, two databases, the Cloud Condor one and the UA one, uh, are not cluster. Uh, it's a single instance. So uh, if, uh, if they're down, it's uh, really problematic for us. Uh, the consequences are uh, concerning the Cloud Controller database that the Cloud Controller API won't be able to work anymore. Uh, the health manager won't be able to do his job anymore, uh, which means that uh, issues uh, could spread in that case, and uh, our API won't be uh, reachable anymore. So uh, that is uh, quite painful for us and for our customers. And the second one is the UA database. Uh, the consequences here is that we won't be able to authenticate our clients anymore, uh, and <laughs> which means we can't let them do anything anymore. Uh, so that's also, uh, that's also an issue there. The next thing we start is the Cloud Controller Blobster. It's a Debian NFS, and it's not clustered in a default uh, Cloud Foundry setup. One reason is because the NFS scales badly. So if the job goes down, you can't push your applications because uh, the build packs are stored there. And also the self-healing doesn't work anymore more because um, the droplets can't be accessed if there is the blob store down. Next one is the HA proxy. So here we have a two-fold problem. Uh, the first one is it's also a, a, a single machine. So uh, if it's down, it's down. Uh, that's uh, something we could, uh, uh, that's something we could uh, avoid uh, by uh, having a HA proxy cluster. Uh, but this will also mean that we will need to, uh, to build our uh, uh, own specific uh, load balancer for the infrastructure. But the second problem is a, is a bigger one for us. Uh, because uh, we have clients pushing their applications on our platform. Uh, some of them might need uh, secure connections. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's something that's quite important for them. Uh, but that also means that they need to host their SSL certificates uh, on, our, uh, web, on, uh, on the web servers. Uh, and that is something that, that is not possible with the uh, HA proxy. An alternative, of course, is that we do uh, upload the um, we do upload the SSL certificates manually for them, uh, something that we've done in the past, but it uh, scales uh, quite badly. So it won't be a, it won't, this won't be our solution. So the next problem comes um, with our um, set, um, setting up, uh, setting up uh, environment. Um, we are using OpenStack with, uh, with DHCP. So we have a problems with uh, static IPs and uh, some templates in Cloud Foundry releases. The problem here is, let's assume you have a virtual machine with a static IP assigned to it. Now the compute node fails where the virtual machine is running. Bosch, um, as I mentioned, it, um, detects that there is a job missing, recreates the virtual machine, and tries to assign the old static IP again to this new virtual machine. But in OpenStack, this uh, uh, static IP can't be reassigned directly because the compute node um, failed. So for us, um, we had a problem with um, IP, static IPs. 
And so we decided to use uh, service discovery via DNS instead of the IPs. And that was a major, uh, one of the big problems we had. And now we can start with the solutions we use uh, to make our system stable and to um, yeah, fulfill our requirements. And we walked through the solutions in the same order we showed you our um, a single point of failures in the static IPs so that you can see um, how it works. So our first issue uh, was with the databases. Uh, and here, uh, since we're a German company, uh, we're environmental friendly. We thought about recycling. Uh, something we already wrote, uh, wrote which is a Bosch release uh, for Postgres that will allow us to, uh, re uh, to build a three nodes uh, cluster. Uh, making, this, uh, making this more stable, uh, we have uh, redundant data, and uh, we, can, uh, uh, yeah, we can be confident that uh, this service will be up all time. Uh, if you want to know more about it, uh, you can watch uh, the talk of uh, our CEO uh, yesterday. Uh, if this is too complicated, you can read our blog post. Uh, you can find it on uh, our blog, any9s. Uh, dot com slash blog, I think, or blog that any nines dot com. Uh, we where we go more in more in depth uh, uh, about the theme of uh, building uh, uh, this uh, Postgres bash release. So the next thing was the cloud controller blob store. And what we have done is taking the blob store out of the cloud foundry system and using external blob store, which is clustered and redundant. Uh, at the time we used that, we have two possibilities. They op use OpenStack Swift or Amazon S3. And as I mentioned, we are running all on, our, on our own OpenStack, so we use the OpenStack Swift with, uh, within our system. And the connection between this new external blob store and the cloud controller wasn't really a big problem because you can use the um, FOC library, which is already in this um, Cloud Foundry system, and so it's, it was easy to connect this database. You just have a uh, prop store. You just have to um, change the APIs and the credentials, and so we can use the external prop store. Now the uh, HA proxy. So, like I said, uh, this issue was twofold, uh, and the most important problem for us was uh, serving clients, right? So, um, uh, our solution for the SSL certificates. Um, was to uh, create a Bosch release uh, with, um, uh, that will allow our customers to upload their, uh, their uh, certificates. I'm repeating myself. Uh, so for that, we wrote uh, an a, um, a virtual host API to which the clients can talk. Uh, this virtual host API will then forward uh, the user data uh, via RabbitMQ messages, uh, which, will then, which will then land uh, on the virtual hosts on the, our SSL gateways. Uh, and um, on our SSL gateways, we have workers who will then take care of uh, reconfiguring uh, our Nginx uh, web server. So, uh, so that, uh, yeah, the SSL, uh, the, the certificates, uh, private keys can uh, go from the clients to uh, the web servers. Uh, and because we wrote that ourselves, we also wrote it in a way that we could now uh, cluster uh, those SSL gateways, ensuring uh, once again a redundancy uh, and uh, availability. Um, yeah, now coming to the static IPs. As I said before, we try to use um, DNS service discovery. Therefore, we deployed a console cluster in parallel to our Cloud Foundry system. Yeah, console is, is, um, is a service which you can use for service discovery. It provides a domain name system that resolves host names to IP addresses. And so the host, if the host, the host gets a new IP address, the, ho uh, the assignment to the host name will be updated. And therefore we created our own Bosch release for console and deploy the console cluster with five console nodes and also two DNS mask servers. Um, to them I will say a little bit later. First, uh, why we are using console. Console have uh, some different components. The console servers, console clients running on the nodes. So the console servers acts like a service registry. 
services can there be registered or updated by any client which send the information to the um, console servers and it all, um, also enables you to discover services and virtual machines by the DNS. Now the console clients, as I mentioned, are um, co-located on each virtual machine we deploy. So if the console shop starts, it automatically sends messages to the console servers. And so um, you have the um, <coughs> host name associated with the IP address. And then you can use the host name for um, access virtual machines backing services. And one advantage of this solution is if one of the nodes gets recreated, um, you have, uh, well, it gets recreated, it gets a new IP address for, from the new uh, virtual machine. Console starts again, registers the new IP address with the old host name, and you have no problem accessing your virtual machine again. So, let, uh, let's talk a little bit um, why we're using the two DNS mask servers also in our console clusters. Um, you can only register two, uh, three um, DNS servers in uh, resolve.conf file on each virtual machine. So one slot is taken by the uh, power DNS of the Bosch director, which can be used for uh, internal um, uh, micro Bosch DNS host names. So you have two slots available. There you could um, just uh, set one console node and one public server, but then you have the problem that you still have two single points of failure. If one fails, it doesn't work properly. So we decided to use two DNS marks server with our own release for them, Bosch release. So um, yeah, the two DNS mask servers are configured as a load balancer in the resolve.com and also do some health checks. Another advantage of this console cluster um, is um, because of our the, um, service framework we built that's also using host names for um, access um, by, uh, for the connection between applications and service instances. So we just can use the console cluster we deployed here for um, the application. This means if you create your service and bind an app to it, your app gets the host name and connects via the host name and not via the IP address, and so the failover is still working. That this, that the, this is working, um, you have to update the resolve.conf on the DAs so that the host names can resolve um, correctly. So uh, that was it for us. Uh, I hope uh, we get you uh, interested and uh, curious about the theme. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for being here. It was for both of us our first uh, conference talk ever. So uh, thank you for your support. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I, it's not multi-tenant, um, so we don't have these um, problems. Um, and, but I must say I'm not really uh, into exactly how the, um, the SSL gateways have been built because um, we started with it very um, at the beginning. I can ask uh, if you have, want to get more details, I can ask my colleague who should help this um, talk and he gets you more details about it. Yeah, um, when we started, there was no console in Cloud Foundry, so we can um, adapt our own cluster uh, in parallel. Now we are, use, um, we are doing a lot of experiments trying to um, use our um, console cluster also in the, um, console, uh, in the Cloud Foundry system. But at the moment, we have both. That means we have a console server in Cloud Foundry for the internal um, resolving and also our console cluster for resolving the host names of the service instances. But then in the resolve function, we're having the local host for the console. Exactly. Uh, like at the same time, like how your system uh, can actually check like, which, console, which console server will resolve the IP? 
Um, yeah, um, we uh, connected them with uh, over our DNS mass server so that they can access them in a um, different order. So depending on the, um, the job um, which um, has the console in the resolve.conf, he's first asking the internal cloud, con uh, cloud foundry console and then the, uh, on the other virtual machine, the uh, DS. Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> Say out loud. Yeah, how, how frequently do you all update your cloud foundry and how many, like what's the approximate scale of running, how many VMs and? Yeah. Um, Actually, it's um, as we are not as big uh, as a big team as the um, as we would might be or would love to be. It's really hard for us to keep in the pace of Cloud Foundry, as it mentioned on the first day, every two weeks. We try to keep up. At the moment, we are at version 230, and um, yeah, the size of the systems always change depending on how many uh, applications are running. Um, I think at, um, if there are a lot of loud it's a, uh, um, op applications and you know, customers using it, there are about um, 80 virtual machines. Yeah, and a lot of them are the DAs um, separated in the uh, three availability zones. So we have about 60 DAs and then also three co um, cloud controller and stuff like that. And what's the team size there? Sorry? Uh, we're uh, between 10 and 15. So 15, but not all working full time. Any other question? Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much.